Hi everyone, welcome to Rising Wave Launch Week. Uh, this is a brand new initiative, community initiative from us uh, for community members to engage on our product updates. Um, since this is an inaugural edition, I want to go a little bit into detail uh, to explain what is Launch Week and how, how we run this, uh, a little bit of background on that. So this is a new series we're launching, announcing called Rising Wave Launch Week. Uh, you may have heard the concept of Launch Week with uh, from different companies. Um, these are run in various formats. Um, some of them, some of the companies are make it very formal. Uh, they run annually, biannually. It's, a, it's more like a full day event. Um, in our case, we've chosen to do it more informal, short presentation, format series. Um, the idea is to keep, uh, you know, very short focused on a feature level uh, presentation as opposed to a general strategic or overall, um, you know, uh, format. And this is obviously geared at community engagement. Uh, this is not so much as a marketing initiative or trying to um, talk about talk up about our product but more to give you a quick sense of what um, we are working on and what we are releasing that you can use um one of the things is we already have uh, obviously our community is a thriving community there's a lot of users and for every release we uh, have a blog that kind of details key features we have change log we have documentation so in a way those are uh, one-way communications. We want this initiative to be a two-way communication so that not only do we talk about key product updates, but also give you a chance to interact with the product team. So if you have a question or comment, uh, we want this to be a channel through which you can reach us. Um, obviously, these are product updates. Do not cover everything that we release. Um, this is meant to be a um, about, like as I said, based on a topic like key features or things that we feel are um, would be very valuable for community at large. Um, but if you feel like our topics did not cover anything that you uh, care for, you can always submit ideas to us of what you want covered in, in the future uh, versions of Launch Week. Um, each session will include Q&A because uh, this is critical for us to get feedback both positive and negative from the users on uh, on how we're doing. And if you want to learn more or join for future Launch Week series, um, we, we're not starting any new uh, channels or anything. It's You can go to our existing meetup group. Um, I have the URL there, meetup.com, Rising Wave Community, to join that meetup group. And all the future Launch Week sessions will also be posted there. The schedules will be posted. And of course, please, I encourage you to join our Slack community as well. So that was the what part of it, the how, like how do we run it? Our goal is to run it on a quarterly cadence. This is, as I said, this is not an annual by annual event. This is more an ongoing event. The idea is to communicate often. Now we kept it quarterly. We could move it to more bi-monthly or monthly, depending on how, um, you know, community receives it and based on the initial feedback. But I, our idea is to start with on, on a quarterly cadence at this point. And the topics, as I said, will include only the top key features. Uh, like for example, in this edition, we picked three features to go with. We could expand that to five, but I, at the same time, this is not meant to go into every little detail that we release uh, from Rising Wave. And each of the sessions we will cover what the feature is and what possible use cases where the feature can be used. And optionally in certain cases where um, there is sufficient interest, we'll go, we'll deep dive into the feature architecture, like how we implemented and what are the trade-offs we uh, thought of before um, we decided on uh, what we picked, what choices we made. And then also we may do some comparative analysis with other industry solutions, for example, if another product has the similar feature, how does Rising Waves version uh, uh, compares with the other uh, industry solutions so that you can see the strengths 
uh, of what our solution is. So as I said, we are really excited about this new series. We feel, um, although this is a community effort, this is for the community, obviously. So we want community participation and feedback. Um, and I think that's the best way to uh, move, move uh, this initiative forward. All right. Let's look at the agenda for this week. Um, as I mentioned, this is a first time we're doing it. So we decided to go with three topics for this week. Um, today, I'm going to talk about time travel queries. And we'll be doing more. The format we picked is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so that um, every day we talk, uh, every other day, we pick one topic. And the goal is to keep it very simple, uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes maximum. For the, I know time investment is a big deal for everyone. So we didn't want it to be a long session. We just wanted to be a short where we could just focus on one topic, have a quick demo, and then have some questions. So for this week, we have three different topics. I'm going to talk about time travel today. On Wednesday, we have subscriptions, which is another uh, feature that we uh, very sought of to feature a lot of our customers and users um, are, are using it. And then finally, on Friday, we released Python SDK. Um, this is a key value add for data scientists, for folks who want to use Notebook to access Rising Web. So we're going to go over um, Python SDK on the, on the last day. OK, now switching gears to the topic today. So time travel queries is a, is a feature that we introduced in uh, 2.0, which is our the last major release we released in uh, we released in September. So, for folks who are not so familiar with time travel queries, um, I just wanted to define uh, talk a little bit about what the feature does. As the name suggests, this basically allows you users to access historical data, right? So when as in a when you are either a uh, you know traditional database or a streaming database you have data processing that happens continuously. So at any time when you access the data, you get the latest snapshot of what the data looks like. And any queries you run reflect that state of data at that time. What time travel allows you to do is go back in time, as the name suggests, uh, to look at how the data looked at the time when you are accessing, right? And this is very important because in a general sense, when you want to answer a question at any time, uh, at the current time, your default mode is what predominantly you will use. But in certain special situations, you may want to go back and see what did the structure of the data look like? What are the answer for the same question that I'm asking now? What would have been the answer if it was asked like a month back or a week or a one day ago, right? And where this is useful is in some scenarios. Like for example, if you want to see a particular data set has been, uh, how does that, uh, if you want to access, browse the data to see what the trends look like. Like for example, if you're trying to create a report, uh, and of course those reports, if there's a particular logic in those reports that was not implemented previously, and you want to see, you can do that uh, with, with time, time travel queries, because you basically can go and see what did the data look like, right? The second thing is, if you want to track changes, like for example, if you're doing auditing or if you're running any comp compliance reports and you want to see what changes happen to the data over a period of time um, for, for legal purposes, or if you want to do the data lineage, like for example, in terms of a certain uh, trends you want to see in the data, for example, on the upstream source, things changed. Is it because of some transformational logic or because of a schema change? How did we arrive at this particular point in current time? So all those changes, if you want to track, um, time travel would be a great way to arc, uh, capture the data and then go back in time. And the third one is basically sometimes if you accidentally delete the data, for example, you ran a job or manual error or because of some bad logic, you lost some data. And if you want to restore the data. Now, obviously, if you have backup snapshots, you could do that. But say you want to do it in a quick, easy way, um, where you can just do it without having to reload the data from a snapshot, you could do it through time travel queries. So there is there's additional uh, scenarios 
uh, you know, because, for example, the first one, when we talk about access data that has been updated, deleted, this can manifest itself in the form of reports, dashboards, or even models. Like, for example, if you're building a model and if you want to see how your model would perform if a particular data, if, if a data set hasn't been modified or deleted or updated, in, in the in, in certain form. So if you want to perform some what if scenarios, all of those are also uh, uh, use cases that we will that this particular feature will will be useful for. Um, this is a powerful feature and it's only available as a premium edition feature at this point. And some of you may have attended the webinar last week where Engine presented what premium edition means. It's a set of features that are available only via uh, a license key. Now, if you are a cloud user, you don't have to worry about license key. You, it's it's available by default. But if you are a self-deploying user, then you would need to uh, procure a license key to access this feature. So just let's see the contrast between what time travel query and the default querying mode is, right? Because this is important to make the distinction. Now, by default, time travel is not enabled. You would have to enable it, right? The default querying mode presents the latest snapshot, as I mentioned, of the data. And you can perform all the DML operations, uh, all the insert, update, delete, of course, selects. You can do all those on the data going forward as the change, as the data evolves. But with the time travel queries, you're basically going back in time and you get a, you are presented a point in time snapshot of the data. And the only operation that we are allowed, that you're allowed to do now are select operations. You can go and look at and see how the data is. And then you can make a copy of the data. You can do obviously additional uh, modifications on it. But the idea is it, these are select operations only that are allowed going back in time. And how far can you back, go back in time is dependent on how you set up the history, like how long you want to capture the history because the longer you want to capture, there's longer history you want to capture on the metadata and data side. So that will determine um, what sort of queries, how long, how far back you can go. Let's go back to how you set up the time travel query. So we introduced a new uh, clause called for system time as of. This is a uh, new uh, addition to the SQL language that we added. So whenever you want to uh, run us time travel queries, a select statement should end with this particular clause because that will tell the system to go back in time and try to get the answer, right? In particular, uh, and the and, and the time in this has to be specified as part of the clause. And you can do that through three different ways. One is through a interval that's related to the current time. Like for example, if you say, um, I want to see a particular run query, uh, like say one day before. So you can use that now function to define what the current timestamp is and then go back in time. So for example, today now it's um, October 14th, Monday, say you want to know how things were on Sunday, October 13th, you could say now minus whatever that one day or one a few hours, whatever the parameter you can specify. The second time, second thing is through uh, date time time strengthening. Like for example, if you are if you care only about a specific time, like say I want to know on October 12th, 9 a.m. PST, you could specify that timestamp. So that will tell you exactly a at the time what the state of the data was. And then the third way is Unix timestamp. So in seconds, you can just, sometimes some applications return Unix timestamp, so it's easy to plug in. So that's the third option we have. So you have flexibility in terms of, in three ways you can mention the time and then run the queries. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the longer your history uh, you keep, the more storage space you need, right? Obviously it makes sense because uh, when you turn on uh, time uh, time travel queries, that needs to have the metadata and the copies of all of the modifications that happened because you're basically creating an audit trail of all the changes that were performed on the database uh, once those were turned on. Because for our query engine to go back and get that particular data, it has to know exact version of how the data looked at particular point. So in a way you are accruing more and more storage the longer the window of the time travel query is now 
the the common question you get is like how how often how when how what is the process of reclamation of that space right both the metadata and on the storage side so this is done automatically for the user they don't have to worry about it um basically say if you set the uh, history to be one week it's as a, the trailing part of the week where the beginning of when the history started that gets automatically uh, 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 pruned based on reclamation algorithm that we have and this is done for both metadata and for s3 or whatever the object store where you store the data so you don't have to it's not a burden on the user to go and check uh, it's done automatically by the system all right um now we come to the part for a quick demo uh, just to give you this is a very simple demo to show uh, the power of this feature uh, in terms of running um the uh, the fee, the the queries in three different ways that that i mentioned and also talk about how to set up this uh get up so it is a recorded demo so i want to make sure that um you are able to hear so i'm, I'm going to turn it on now time travel queries are a new feature introduced in rising wave 2.0 it is a premium edition feature, so you'll need a license key in order to use this feature. You can contact us to get a free trial license for testing. If running Rising Web locally, like we are in this demo, the license key can be configured in a TOML file or set as an environment variable. For cloud users, there is no need to set license as these features are automatically available. We have configured the license key before starting this rising wave instance so let's check if the license key is valid by running the following command select rw test paid tier if it is valid the query will run will return true additionally for time travel queries make sure that your meta store is sql compatible and you have at least 50 gigabytes of disk space available to enable time travel queries, we'll need to set a system parameter called time travel retention MS. We set this using the alter system command, as you see on the screen, to a non-zero value. This parameter determines how long the historical data should be retained within the system before it's deleted. Again, reminder, this needs to be in milliseconds. Here, we'll set it to a value of one hour. Now that the environment is set up, we can start running time travel queries now. First, we'll create a table named time travel that has two columns and we'll insert three rows of data into it. This demo is currently uh, October 10th, 2024 at 1.18 p.m. PST. That's the time um, uh, of the time of the demo. Rising Wave uses UTC time, so for all intents and purposes, the time is 8, 18 p.m. from a clock perspective. Let's make some changes to the table. We'll change some existing values, insert some new rows. As you can see, this table is different from the time it was created a minute ago. So if you want to query the table as it was at 1.18 p.m. PST, we can use the time travel query. In Rising Wave, this can be done by adding a new clause that has been introduced. It's called first system time as of. This clause is added to the end of the query and the time travel period can be specified in three different ways. First, it can be specified as an interval relative to the current time as shown on the screen now. Like we are here showing that it's now minus one minute. And we see that the query returns what the table looked when we first added the first three rows. The second way you can do it is using a date time string. Again, Rising Wave uses UTC time, so you'll need to convert the timestamp to UTC before you uh, come up with the date time string. The third way you do it using specifying uh, Unix time, but in seconds. Let's make an additional update to the table before we run the last time travel query. We're making the change at 8.24 p.m. UTC and changing the value of column C2 from 10 to 5, where this column C1 value is 1. 
now when you run the time travel query specify this unix timestamp in seconds to travel back to 822 utc and you will see that the value of c2 when c1 is 1 is back to 10 not 5 as we made in the update statement before this is a simple short demo to showcase time travel queries in three different ways and if you have any further questions please reach out our support or consult our documentation thank you all right thank you that was a short demo um time travel queries are a new feature introduced in rising okay next next slide okay so that kind of finishes our demo and i want to open up for any q a questions you have uh, about the feature or in general about the launch week um and let's see Okay, I don't see any question. Do you see anything, um, Joanna? No, it seems there are no questions this time. Okay. All right, if there are no questions, I mean, you can always reach out to us on um, uh, our community Slack or, you know, just reply back to the email you, you received from us and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, and if you have general feedback on the format, because we are this is a new initiative, so we are trying to learn and see how best we can, um, you know, make this more useful for you for your time. So let us know. Raise there is actually one question. If we can take a look at it. Okay, let me see. Okay, the question is for fifty GB of disk space, how much historical data is retained? So this is a great question. Now, the 50 GB is minimum, right? It, it It's totally dependent on how large your database is and how much of, uh, uh, how, how bursty is your application, how many updates are happening, right? So in a way, um, it's a, it, there's no straight answer. I could tell you that it, you could only run it for, um, you could run for one day or one, but 50 gig, we keep it as, as a bare minimum. Um, we have um, <clears throat> logging to indicate where uh, you know uh, how to estimate, but uh, it's 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 more internal logging we have. Um, yeah, I see that there is a. Is it possible for the time not for each query but for the series of further questions? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good, uh, I think the, the question, let me repeat the question. Is it possible to specify the time, not just for each query so that it applies for the entire? Um, unfortunately, at this point, it is set at the query level. Um, I would take that feedback back to the engineering team to see if we can do a session parameter, session level parameter, so that you can set it and then it would apply for the entire session. Um, that's a great su suggestion, Serhi. I will I will uh, let the team know. Okay, let's see if there is anything else. Uh, okay, if there are no other questions, thank you everyone. Appreciate your time, and we hope you join us on Wednesday. Subscriptions is another feature are pretty popular, and we hope to cover that. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.